Hello everyone. Welcome back to this RSET webinar series on satellite observations and tools for fire risk detection and analysis. I am Amita Mehta and this is part 5 of this series in which we are going to focus on post-fire impacts on water resources and disasters. In sessions 1 and 2, we looked at pre-fire weather and climate conditions, vegetation health and fire fuel conditions using remote sensing observations and earth system model data. Also in parts 3 and 4, uh, we looked at fire and smoke detection from satellite observations and impacts on air quality. Today and next week, we will learn to analyze post-fire impacts on water resources and vegetation. In addition to myself, we have Sean McCartney presenting a case study today. And we also have a guest speaker, Eli Orland from NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Also, as in previous sessions, this session will be presented in Spanish this afternoon by Dr. Erika Podest from NASA JPL. So here's the overall outline for today. We will have a brief review of how fires can impact water resources and disasters. Then I will present a case study about post-fire analysis for recent California fires. And Sean McCartney will do the same for fires in Portugal. Finally, Eli Orland will be presenting a post-fire debris flow and landslide model which is based on remote sensing data. So we'll start with post-fire impacts. Fires are a part of the natural forest, grassland, and tundra environment. And fires have long-lasting impacts on surrounding human lives and infrastructure. Some of the major post-fire impacts are listed here. Uh, release of carbon dioxide and soot particles in the atmosphere, which influences climate then change in soil chemistry and reduction in soil fertility because of fire, destruction of vegetation leading to increased runoff and soil erosion post fire, influence of on nutrient cycling and flow, and destruction of ecosystems and wildlife. So wildfires have short and long-term impacts on water resources. In the short term, post fire erosion and runoff transport sediments, debris, and chemicals to streams, lakes, and water supply reservoirs affecting drinking water quality. As shown in this figure, here there is post-fire ash spills in these lakes, which alters water quality. In the long term, fires can alter watershed characteristics due to changes in soil chemistry, water infiltration capacity, and runoff, and that alters stream flow intensity and patterns. In the US, approximately 80% of freshwater resources originate on forested land, and more than 3,400 communities rely on public drinking water systems located in watersheds on forest lands, which puts them at risk of wildfires. So wildfires substantially impact the quantity and quality of runoff used for source water and also impact fisheries and aquatic habitats. This picture shows an example from 2009 station fire in California. So many rainbow trout died as a result of post-fire water quality changes. Post-fire impact on water quality is a concern for communities worldwide where water is drawn from forested watersheds. So as quoted in this Yale report, after fires in Australia, water quality was impacted so much and it got so poor that city of Canberra was forced to build a new water treatment plant. As climate change is likely to make fires more frequent and more intense, there will be increased threats of water to water supplies and aquatic systems. This figure shows Cameron Falls in Alberta, Canada. It turned black with soot and charred debris uh, following a fire event that occurred almost one year before the debris started flowing in. 
So both in short term and long term, worldwide community is concerned about post-fire water quality impact. Specifically for drinking water, post-fire runoff from burned areas bring ash, nitrates, sediments, and bacteria such as E. coli to rivers, lakes, and reservoirs, demanding increased pretreatment of drinking water to avoid health risks. During and immediately after a fire, operations of water treatment plants may be interrupted for a number of reasons, such as inaccessibility to the plant due to its location near fires, there could be power outages, also inability to collect and check in situ water quality for treatment, all these may force source water supply to be changed to uh, stored water or some other secondary sources. In long term, changes in drinking water chemistry can force changes in water treatment. So both again in short term and long term, uh, post-fire impact on water quality and drinking water treatment can be a huge uh, economic impact on the communities. To summarize, post-fire watershed level primary risk factors to drinking water that depend on these factors, such as burn patterns and intensity, uh, topography, vegetation, soil quality, and hydrology, they impact surface water quality. There is also increased risk of post-fire disasters. Uh, generally, vegetation absorbs rainfall and reduces or controls runoff. When wildfires destroy forests and vegetation, leaving the ground burned, barren, and uh, unable to absorb water, then there is usually increase in runoff during post-fire rain events. Especially when there is heavy rain uh, going on post-fire, that can increase runoff and trigger flash floods, debris flow, and even landslides. Flood risk remains higher until vegetation is restored uh, in its original condition, and studies have shown that it can take up to five years. So generally, post-fire, there is increased risk of flooding. Uh, there's an example shown here, and in picture, it's a post-fire mudslide that occurred in 2018 in Santa Barbara County, California. Um, there, there was a devastation, a lot of infrastructure got damaged in, in this Montecito area. Here is a USGS video that was taken from an automatic rain-triggered camera, and it shows um, post-fire flooding um, in Orange County, California, following a Silverado fire that burned about two and a half miles square and after the fire, when there was a heavy rain event, uh, flood occurred and this stream got a lot of poor uh, quality water because of that. And let's see this video for just a few seconds. So these disasters are linked in the sense that um, post-fire, if there is heavy rain, there would be increased runoff, there would be flooding, that could be mudslide or landslide, and definitely it will bring poor water uh, quality into streams and lakes in, in the area where the fires were. So that brings us to our case study where we're going to look at post-fire water quality in, in California. As we saw in session one, um, in 2020, there were more than 8,000 fire events in California, burning close to 1.4 million acres of area. Uh, three major fire centers are shown here in this map. The first one, this one is North Complex Fire that occurred in the Feather River watershed. Creek Fire that's in San Joaquin River watershed and SQF or Sequoia complex fire, which is this one, occurred in Kern River watershed. The areas shown in these maps, they are burn area because of these fires. For the water quality case study, we are going to focus on this North complex fire in Feather River watershed. 
So North or Bear Fire, um, it started in, uh, in August. Specifically, there was a lightning strike on 17th of August that started the fire. And eventually that resulted in a firestorm on September 8th. Uh, because of the fire, there was onset of intense winds and there was also another lightning uh, sparked fire. Uh, so that every, all that merged and this entire area got covered by fires. And that is Bear Fire or North Complex Fire. So Western part of this North Complex Fire burned over 70,000 acres by September 11th. And the fire severely damaged communities around Lake Oroville, which is shown here in this map, and um, in this water, uh, Feather River watershed. The Bear Fire, um, as seen here uh, near Lake Oroville on 9th September, destroyed vast swaths of forest increasing the chances of ash and debris flow into the lake via Feather River tributaries. Lake Oroville supplies drinking water to 25 million people in Southern California, so the impacts could be wide ranging. Also, Feather River is a hatchery for Chinook salmon uh, returning um, upriver to spawn. So monitoring post-fire water quality here in this area is very important. To understand post-fire watershed conditions, we look at MODIS NDVI, IMERGE precipitation and GL dust soil moisture and runoff in the Lake Oroville and Feather River region. We have used GeoMoney to obtain these data sets. We've also obtained SRTM terrain data for this region using USGS Appears tool. And recall that all these data sets and tools were introduced and used in session one and some in session two. We will see examples of Landsat 8 images also of Lake Oroville uh, in Google Earth Engine to see if we can detect any post-fire changes in the lake water color related to increased sedimentation in the lake. So that is going to be the plan for this case study. We start with the monthly Moody's NDVI analysis. This map shows the area of Feather River watershed and Lake Oroville uh, that got influenced by uh, the Bear Fire events. Next, we see differences in MODIS NDVI between November and May of 2020. That is, the differences between post-fire season and pre-fire season NDVI. The negative differences indicate decrease in NDVI or that is decrease in vegetation. As we can see in the map, um, in this watershed and also around this lake, um, th these differences are negative indicating destruction of vegetation. If we look at SRTM terrain, this is in meters, we can see that um, Lake Oroville is downslope of these mountains to the east. And that makes it susceptible uh, to increased probability of flooding in this area. If we look at the time series of NDVI averaged over this map area between March, that is pre-fire, during fire and then post fire. So March to November time series is shown here. Um, bear fires started in mid-August and it peaked by mid-September. And we can see that there is dramatic decrease in NDVI as vegetation gets destroyed in this area due to fire. And then it continues to be low in post fire season. Next, we monitor hydrology components uh, for the same period and in the same region. And this time series show monthly IMERGE precipitation, GL dust, soil moisture, and runoff. Again, in pre-fire, during fire, and post-fire conditions. What we see here is that just before the fire event and during the fire, so between August and September, there is minimum precipitation, soil moisture, and runoff. 
and post fire in in fall season rainfall increases and that is also reflected in increase in soil moisture and runoff so the overall decreases that we saw in vegetation through ndvi and uh, increases in rainfall soil moisture and runoff after september uh, potentially can increase the post fire risk of erosion sediment and debris flow into the feather river tributaries and lake Oroville. This impact of course will depend on the rainfall intensity and amount of rainfall getting into the streams and lake uh, through burn areas. The probability of flooding and even landslide may increase if heavy rains occur in the region in this post-fire season. But these data sets uh, basically show a consistent picture of uh, during and post-fire conditions. Further monitoring of daily rainfall and runoff can help in anticipating subsequent risk of poor water quality and flooding in short term. So here we show daily IMERGE precipitation and three hourly runoff time series. Uh, this is post fire. So after September, then the rain events can be seen in November and December and corresponding increase in runoff can also be seen here. Monitoring magnitudes of these quantities uh, can guide um, in when to anticipate poor water quality and it can help in planning for collection of water samples for testing water quality and planning for water treatment. Similarly, observing heavier than normal rainfall and runoff events could help in assessing the risk for flooding. Again, more quantitative, spatial, and temporal analysis and assessment of uh, rainfall and runoff thresholds would be needed for better prediction and preparedness uh, against flooding and poor water quality. But this is just to show that this data can be useful um, for looking at watershed processes that can indicate um, decrease in vegetation, increase in runoff, um, and uh, may be leading to poor water quality in lakes and streams. So later in this session, uh, Eli Orlando will demonstrate how some of these data can be used more quantitatively in modeling landslides. In addition to monitoring the hydrologic components as we saw in the Feather River Lake Oroville region, we can actually monitor optical images of streams and lakes to see if there is any increase in sediment in the water or can we detect it in optical images. So here we show an example of using Google Earth Engine to view Landsat 8 images. Specifically, uh, we look at surface reflectance from Landsat 8 operational land imager, which has 30 meter special resolution. So here is a true color image for 16th January 2021. Uh, this, was, this was the first image we found after observing several post-fire rain events in November and December of 2020. If you zo zoom into that image to Lake Oroville, um, here you can see in this area, if you look carefully compared to this, there is higher reflectance hinting to the presence of sediments in this part of the lake. Now image processing uh, is required and preferably together with in situ data to derive water quality parameters such as suspended sediments and turbidity uh, in, in the lake. And this advanced level RCET webinar covers that procedure of image processing and deriving water quality parameters just for your information. Finally, we show here a uh, Landsat 8 images for pre and post fire periods. This is again using GEE. These images show near infrared or NIR band 5 from operational land imager. This is 3rd of April 2020 and this is 16th of January 2021. Now, NIR reflectance reflectances, they have been shown to have better correlation with suspended sediments in water bodies. 
In this post-fire season, following the increased rainfall and runoff events, it appears that in this part of Lake Oroville, there is more suspended sediments, uh, especially in this western and southern part, and you can also see in some of these streams uh, that could be increased in sediments. Uh, so this is just an example of just looking at images and gauging if um, you can see change in colors, which can indicate uh, increased sediments or turbidity of the lake. So this concludes the Bear Fire case study, uh, where we analyzed NDVI, rainfall, and runoff, along with examples of optical images to demonstrate how this information can be useful for better understanding and planning for impacts on post-fire flooding and water quality management. So next, we will have Sean McCartney. He will present a case study of post-fire conditions in Portugal. Thank you, Sean. Thanks, Amita. For our second case study on post-fire conditions, we'll turn to the country of Portugal in southwestern Europe. Portugal is located on the Iberian Peninsula, bordering the North Atlantic Ocean west of the country of Spain. The country includes the archipelagos of Madeira and the Azores. At 92,000 square kilometers, the country is slightly smaller than the U.S. state of Virginia. The elevation on the mainland ranges from sea level to 2,000 meters, with a mountainous northern interior and rolling plains in the south. Portugal has a Mediterranean climate with a hot summer in the south and central interior, and warm summer in the higher northern elevations. Eucalyptus, cork oak, and maritime pine together make up 71% of the total forested area of continental Portugal. Due to its climate and ecosystem, Portugal, along with the greater Mediterranean, are prone to forest fires. The 2017 fire season in Portugal set new records for area burned and lives lost. A total of 500,000 hectares burned during the extreme fire season with 120 deaths attributed to wildfire. The two main fire events took place during the months of June and October, but were the compound effect of drought and high temperatures throughout the summer and fall fire season. An intense heat wave preceded the June fires, with many areas of Portugal seeing temperatures in excess of 40 degrees centigrade. For this case study, we'll be demonstrating the use of Climate Engine for assessing the, pre, the fire conditions in Portugal. Climate Engine was created by the Desert Research Institute and the University of Idaho, and is powered by Google Earth Engine and the Google Cloud for on-demand processing of satellite and climate data via a web browser. The application includes anomaly mapping, time series and statistical summaries, and easy access for visualizing and interacting with Earth observation datasets. Climate Engine also overcomes computational limitations of big data for real-time monitoring, provides a comprehensive set of variables that provide early warning indicators of climate impacts to wildfire, and provides the ability to download and share results instead of processing entire data archives locally. In the example shown on this slide, we're using Climate Engine to graph a summary time series of chirps, precipitation, deviations from the mean from 2000 to 2020. Climate Engine allows users to define their region of interest by point, user-defined polygon, or an uploaded shapefile. It also provides world regions to define a country scale analysis, or users can select from US states, US counties, and Native American tribal areas. In this demo, I've selected Portugal from the world regions, specifying precipitation as the variable to graph and mean as the statistic. Once the graph is generated, 
we can quickly identify which years were above or below average precipitation for the 20 years specified. I've circled the year 2017, showing how Portugal received below average precipitation for the year. The ability to generate a time series of pentad precipitation deviations from the mean over the past 20 years for the country of Portugal in less than a minute is a very powerful tool in examining climate drivers for fire. This slide is showing a summary time series of GLDAS root zone soil moisture deviations from the mean from 2000 to 2020. The Global Land Data Assimilation System, or GLDAS, ingests satellite and ground-based observational data products using advanced land surface modeling and data assimilation techniques in order to generate optimal fields of land surface states and fluxes. Dry soil is linked to more fires, but fires can also cause dry soil, which can affect soil water availability for agriculture, negatively impacting crop health and production. Soil moisture can aid local governments and response agencies in better anticipating and preparing for an active fire season and aid in tracking the potential impact of fire on soil water availability and crop production. For the region of interest, I've specified Portugal for the analysis. Again, I've circled the year 2017 to highlight the deficit in root zone soil moisture for this devastating year of wildfires in Portugal. Switching from the Make Graph to Make Map tab in Climate Engine, we can use the same CHIRPS Pentad Precipitation dataset to map the Standardized Precipitation Index, or SPI, for Southern Europe. SPI is a widely used index to characterize meteorological drought on a range of timescales. SPI values can be interpreted as the number of standard deviations by which the observed anomaly deviates from the long-term mean. In the example shown on this slide, I've input variables and parameters for Climate Engine to calculate SPI for the two and a half months leading up to the mid-June 2017, just prior to the first major wildfire in Portugal's record-breaking fire season. SPI is comparing the two and a half month period of precipitation to the same two and a half month period ranging from 1981 to 2020. We can see from the mapped output, most of Southern Europe is in a precipitation deficit, especially regions of the Iberian Peninsula, most of Italy, and the islands of Sardinia and Corsica in the Mediterranean. Land surface temperature is one of the products derived from the MODIS sensor on board NASA's Aqua and Terra satellites. On this slide, we've used Climate Engine to compute uh, land surface temperature differences from average. We've specified one month, June 15th to July 15th, 2017, as the study period, comparing land surface temperatures with the same one month period from 2000 to 2021. The output shows active burn areas, burn scars, and high land surface temperatures during and immediately post fire. You can replicate these same steps using different months or years to assess the impacts post fire on land surface temperatures for your own study area. One method to assess post fire damage to vegetation is by using the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index or NDVI. NDVI is directly related to vegetation's photosynthetic capacity, or more simply, the greenness of plant and forest canopies observed from aerial or space-based platforms. In this slide, we're using NDVI derived from three different Landsat missions, Landsat 5, 7, and 8, to calculate the NDVI difference from average from the beginning of August through the end of December 2017 compared to the historical average. In this analysis, we've specified the historical average to range from 2000 to 2017. In the resulting map, 
we see NDVI anomalies shown in red, corresponding to dead or damaged vegetation within Portugal. The polygon on the left highlights two disconnected forested areas along the Atlantic coast heavily damaged by the 2017 wildfires. The polygon in black on the right shows large patches of post-fire burned areas in the Pedregal Grande municipality. On this slide, we're showing how to use Climate Engine to visualize the burned area index, or BAI, derived from the MODIS instrument on NASA's Terra satellite. We've specified Climate Engine to compute the burned area index difference from average, showing anomalies in burned area for the period of August through December 2017, compared to the same five months over the 20-year period from 2000 to 2021. The ability to overcome computational limitations of big data and produce the on-demand anomaly maps in minutes is one of the powers of Climate Engine. In the map on the right, we can see burned areas in dark red captured within the black polygon. These are large swaths of central Portugal heavily impacted by the 2017 wildfires. <clears throat> On this slide, we're showing how satellite imagery still detects low NDVI values one year after the devastating wildfires of 2017. Using Landsats 7 and 8, we are able to quickly run an analysis to determine the NDVI difference from average from June to July 2018 compared to the average NDVI values for this region from 1984 to 2020. We can still see the impact the devastating wildfires had in central Portugal, and this analysis can be run over subsequent years to determine the rate of regrowth and recovery in forest cover. <clears throat> For assessing the risk of rainfall triggered landslides, we will change the tab in Climate Engine back to the Make Graph option and run a time series analysis of chirps pentad precipitation data. Instead of looking at anomalies, for this output we will graph statistics for total precipitation values from mid-June 2017 to mid-June 2018 to identify when heavy rainfall events occurred that could potentially trigger mass wasting events. This is important in many parts of the world that are prone to disasters such as rainfall triggered landslides. The graph on the right shows heavier rainfall events in early March and, er and April 2018 that could trigger debris flows or landslides. Both of these events are captured by black circles towards the top right of the graph. As Amita discussed earlier, <clears throat> runoff from burned areas can bring ash and sediments to rivers and reservoirs, impacting water quality. Monitoring daily precipitation and runoff helps predict the subsequent risk of poor water quality, flooding, and landslides. One of the ways to analyze this in Climate Engine is by using data from the Famine Early Warning Systems Network Land Data Assimilation System, or FLDAS. FLDAS surface water runoff anomalies can be used to characterize storm events, which could trigger debris flows or landslides. Based on the precipitation totals we graphed on the previous slide, we know March 2018 had the highest rainfall event following the 2017 fire season. The map on the right of the slide shows runoff anomalies for the first half of March 2018, compared to the same two weeks from 2000 to 2020. Having access to runoff data combined with burned areas can better inf inform municipalities regarding risk to their water supply and the potential for flooding and for landslides. As mentioned earlier, Climate Engine provides the ability to download or share results instead of processing entire data archives locally. Maps can be downloaded as raster files in GeoTIFF format and graphs can be downloaded as PNG, JPEG, PDF, 
CSV, or XLS files. You can also share a link to the last successful map result from Climate Engine when you're collaborating with your colleagues. Climate Engine is fully customizable for spatial and temporal analyses, providing a comprehensive set of variables that provide early warning indicators of climate or climate impacts for fire. Finally, to understand how fire can impact land use and land cover, it is important to have access to an accurate and validated land cover map for one's study area. In the case of Portugal and for Europe, one can acquire this through the Copernic Copernicus program. Copernicus is the European Union's Earth Observation Program offering information services that draw from satellite, Earth observation, and in-situ data. From the link at the top of the slide, you can access the web page to visualize and download free land cover maps for anywhere in Europe, though you will have to create an account first. Land cover maps are inventoried for the years 1990, 2000, 2006, 2012, and 2018, spanning 44 different classes. Land cover maps are available for download as either raster or vector files. This concludes the study of post-fire analysis for Portugal. I will now hand the presentation over to my colleague Eli Orlan to discuss post-fire debris flow assessments via remote sensing. Well, thank you so much. Uh, so my name is Elijah or Eli Orland. I'm a researcher at the Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, and I'm hoping to share with you some preliminary work that I'm doing with post-fire debris flow hazard assessment, all performed from remote sensing. Now, to give a very brief background about on this topic, when we think about these steep areas where debris flows might occur, oftentimes they simply don't occur because these unburned landscapes have vegetation in place that oftentimes stabilizes these steep slopes. And these soils that are developing with this plant life tend to readily absorb water. Importantly, any loose sediment that could be existing on these hill slopes is oftentimes physically trapped by the vegetation there. Uh, you can almost think about how a, a dam, a dammed lake holds the water back. Um, you know, it might be less secure than a concrete dam, but oftentimes the vegetation that's on these hill slopes, simply their presence acts as a barrier and catches some of the sediment on these deep hill slopes. Uh, so that's what this looks like in an unburned setting, but obviously the topic of this whole presentation is what fire does. And wildfire ultimately affects these landscapes in some dramatic ways. The first one is hopefully relatively obvious. When you destroy the vegetation there, you're doing two things. You're over the long term getting rid of the roots that hold in, that hold these steep hill slopes in place. Um, those are on sort of yearly time scale or, you know, several year time scales. Um, but more immediately, what you're doing is when you take away that vegetation, you're essentially removing that dam. So all of the sediment that was trapped behind these plants is much easier to mobilize and it's more freely exposed or it's, it's easier to move and more exposed to rainfall that might hit it and want to mobilize that. Uh, secondly, and this one is huge, oftentimes before the wildfire occurs, you have some sort of ground surface full of leaf litter. It could be simply fallen leaves, branches, shrubs. When you burn these, um, these organic materials, oftentimes this waxy substance that is previously on them will vaporize into a gas and go underground. Normally, they re-precipitate just a few centimeters below the soil. But this has profound effects on the soil's ability to absorb and move water through the ground. Ultimately, and I think you can think of this as a hydrophobic layer. It's almost like you're putting a layer of plastic just a few centimeters below the soil. This is very important because during heavy rainfall, all of the water that would have been readily absorbed by the soil can no longer be absorbed, and it frequently gets turned into runoff. So when you combine these things, um, more easily to more excuse me, easier to mobilize sediment, heavy rainfall, and extensive runoff, 
this is where you start thinking about these post-fire debris flows. Like I said, you have much looser debris. It's easy to move. You have lots more runoff. And ultimately, on these steep slopes, it's just this recipe for these turbulent water-filled debris flows. Interestingly, some folks at the USGS that I'm working with, they've been able to show that even somewhat regular rainfall, you know, rainfall rates that occur every year or every two years can generate these debris flows. So we're not talking about these bit once in a 50 year rainfall events, once in a century rainfall events. This is the type of rainfall you would see every year, every other year. Uh, so importantly, after a wildfire, the chances of you experiencing this sort of level of rainfall is actually relatively high, which makes these a significant hazard. And you'll see this photo that I've included here. This is just to put it all into perspective. Um, this is a debris flow that occurred after the station fire, which we'll actually be discussing in just a few moments. But you can see how this turbulent flow took out a whole house. And unfortunately, many people, if you're in the way, many people are killed during these events. So it's very critical that we understand how we might be able to model their hazard. Um, and importantly, even doing it anywhere in the world from remote sensing. Now, of course, the big question is, how can we possibly do this with remote sensing? And it's important for me to very quickly note that there are a number of physically based models that really go into the equations that describe how these debris flows form and how they can carry sediment down slope. Um, one of the challenges with them is that they work really, really, really well for specific areas, but they don't necessarily translate to other areas. So what people like Staley et al, here is a paper of his from 2017, have done is they collect a lot of data linking the slope of an area, the burn severity of an area, and the rainfall that occurred in a given time to the actual occurrence of these debris flows. And they try to come up with some statistical, statistical correlation between these input variables and whether or not a debris flow occurred. A lot of what I'm doing now is building off of the work that they have uh, so excellently done and trying to take what they've done in the Western United States and apply it on a global scale. So this involves using data sets that are only available across the globe um, and oftentimes are at slightly lower resolution than what you might find in the continental United States. Nonetheless, I'm excited to show you some of what we've been able to discover with it. And um, I'm going to be doing this with a small case study because I really want to bring this back to the human side of things, knowing that these natural hazards are affecting us at the end of the day. And I will be, uh, I will, you know, we're going to use the station fire as an example. This is a fire in the state of California, in the western United States. And for 2009, it was the largest fire in the season. It burned almost 650 square kilometers. Two people died, and there were over $100 million worth of damages. Um, and I love this photo um, just because you can see how closely this fire burned to a very populated area in Southern California. Now, and, um, to, use, to, to go through this case study, I will walk you through each of the input variables that I'm using. And if you're, if you're familiar with Google Earth Engine, I, uh, you know, I'm happy to report that you can collect all this information from Google Earth Engine. Um, if you prefer other sources, you can do, it's just fine. You can also use other software to do this. Uh, but, you know, we want to collect topography, or we want to collect information about the topography of an area, of the rainfall, of the burn severity, and we want to have some understanding of what this catchment looks like. Um, so for each of these, you know, you can collect slope information from the NASA DEM or SRTM product. Um, both work that NASA, the NASA DEM product is a little bit more updated, but this is at 30 meter resolution. Um, we're collecting rainfall information from iMERGE. And if this is your first time hearing about iMERGE, it is, uh, it's one of the most incredible, in my opinion, uh, global rainfall data sets we have available right now. And this is at 11 kilometers. You might be wondering, well, 11, you might be saying that 11 kilometers is rather large, um, to which I would respond, you're right. Uh, <laughs> on the other hand, the, this iMERGE data set is able to collect precipitation information from every location on the planet, nearly every location on the planet, every half hour. 
This is unprecedented, and it's wonderful that we have it. Uh, I'm collecting information about the fire severity or the burn severity from Landsat. This is Landsat 7, just given the historical record of the data set. Um, you can use Landsat 8, you can use um, Sentinel, but for my purposes, I'm working with Landsat 7. And there is a great global watershed data set provided by the WWF. And this is the HydroSheds data set. I'm using their level 12 data. <sighs> Finally, we put all of this together and we look at the we look at each of these variables and how they relate to the debris flow occurrence um, based on the storms provided by the USGS in their own database. And it's important to note here that most of these data exist just in the Western United States. So to then try to create a global model uh, of, unfortunately, very spatially exclusive data, it's very tricky. And so what I'm hoping to show you is, um, you know, it, it's an outline of our very first steps towards that, in addition to a number of considerations we are making to ensure that our results could physically transfer to other areas. Now, in the meantime, let's look at the sample basin. Uh, that was hit by the station fire. If you are familiar with uh, Western US geography, I'm not making any assumptions here. Uh, you might have heard of Los Angeles. This is one of the largest cities in the United States. So this is a very densely populated area. You can see that there's a lot of urban buildup just based off of how um, the maps are laid out. And then you get to this green area, and this is really where the station fire occurred in this basin. And you can see that, you know, I've made a note that several debris flows were recorded here over a very short period of time. And you know, these hill slopes lead right down to people's homes. Uh, obviously you're not seeing it here, but you know, so many people live here and it's really scary to think that these debris flows could happen so closely to where you might live, you know, even occurring during the night when you're sleeping. Um, and so one of the questions we really wanna ask here is if we had our modeling capabilities back in 2009, you know, how well could we have forecasted this debris flow activity here? Um, there are obviously a lot of stipulations go into that, but you know, that's really the question we want to have guide us right now. How good of a job could we have done? And if it shows that maybe in the past we could have done a good job, well, then this gives us hope for future for, for the forecasting of future debris flow events. To do this, I want to show you what these data look like. Um, you'll notice that I've foregone a uh, traditional legend. That's because I really want you just to pay attention to the extremes, just to get an idea of what these slopes look like. So these are our hill slopes in the northern part of the basin, and I have a slope map laid out here. You'll see that the steepest slopes are whiter colors, whiter colors, and the more shallow slopes, such as the river channels um, or the um, you know, the more built up areas that will be in black. And this is really just to give you a general idea that this is a very steep area. You know, you can see the channel outlines, um, but it, it's almost no surprise that there are so many debris flows here, just given how steep the, this topography is. And then when we think about how intensely it might've been burned, we oftentimes use a metric called the difference in the normalized burn ratio. Um, unfortunately, this is a little bit beyond the scope of our discussion, but I will say that, and hopefully you'll trust me on this, that it is a reasonable approximation of how badly an area was burned. Uh, you know, I want to make the obligatory comment that nothing will replace the ability to really get your boots on the ground and assess the burn severity for yourself in an area. Um, but, you know, with a global model, that's not feasible, so we have to rely on accurate proxies. And this DMBR value is one of the most accurate proxies we can ask for right now. And what you'll find is the areas in white are the, uh, you know, are essentially the most intensely burnt. Think of these as the areas that were scorched, where those in black remain untouched. For this basin, I calculated that it had a DMBR, a mean DMBR value of 0 0.4, at least for this area, which is to say that it was reasonably reasonably burned and of course that varies spatially but there are several very steep areas that are very intensely burned um, unfortunately this is quite literally a recipe for a natural disaster 
So it, there are a lot of challenges here already for this area. Now, one of the most important factors for any post fire debris flow is you have to have a input of rainfall. And what you're looking at here is the um, a collection of I merge values collected over the storm interval of um, January 17th through 18th back in 2010. So this was just a few months after the fire. Now it, it is worth knowing that several storms occurred here and we're looking at just one of them. And in this single storm, the, uh, the, this basin recorded 41 millimeters of rainfall in 48 hours. Now the discussion of absolute high merge accuracy is you know, it very much is a whole separate topic, but the big takeaway here is that relative to all of the rainfall that IMERG recorded in two years prior to this event, what you'll see here is that this 41 millimeters for that area was the highest in those last two years. So very consistent with what the literature is finding is that this really was sufficient enough to create a debris flow. And the question, you know, maybe we can have some intuition behind this. Uh, but especially for areas where we might not know this information, you know, this is why we're relying on a model. And the big science question here is, well, based on the characteristics of burn severity and topography, in this case, the slope of this area, would our model correctly predict the debris flows that occurred in this basin? And if you ask me, this is where the conversation gets very interesting. To answer this question, I am using a very specific algorithm that uh, utilizes machine learning. And I would always, you know, if you want to learn a little bit more about how we use machine learning specifically in the odds and ends, I would encourage you to reach out to me. Um, but right now, um, for the scope of this presentation, I'll say that this machine learning algorithm does a really excellent job drawing on any empirical relationships that link our three input variables, rainfall, burn severity, and topography, to the occurrence of debris flows as they were recorded by the USGS. Um, in a much simpler fashion, I'll just lay out a very simple equation here. Basically, your slope input and your burn severity and your rainfall, all that comes in together to generate some probability of debris flow occurrence. And you know, a common criticism is that machine learning can be a bit of a black box. Um, something that I will not have the chance to show here, but I would like to assure you all as an audience is that a lot of the methods that we're choosing are meant to be as transparent as possible. So you can always trace back what into what went into making a prediction. Um, and this has great implications for parsing out a lot of the physically important variables in each model prediction. So in this case, um, one of the output probabilities from this model was around 82% of a debris flow. Uh, and we know, as I've told you, that several actually occurred during this storm period. Um, so this now begs the question, well, how do we link this probability that the model um, spit out for us to this really, this very real physical event that occurred? You know, how do we link a percentage to the occurrence of these events? And this is where things get a little tricky, but in my opinion, very exciting. What makes this field in remote sensing such a great um, area of study is that we can then learn from this model and we ultimately want to draw what I will dub and what you might see described elsewhere as a decision boundary. And one that says, well, above this probability, uh, most of the debris flows occur, and also most of the rainfall that does not trigger debris flows, in fact, does not occur. Um, I can say that a little bit more simply. We want to maximize our true positives, and we want to minimize our false alarms of a debris flow, you know, for all other times that it rains. And one of the ways we can do this is uh, through what we call a receiver operating characteristic curve. Um, for the data scientists in the audience, there, you, know, you might know that there are many other ways to go about doing this, um, but this is one of the uh, most straightforward and it's, uh, it's obviously a very effective one. 
So I want to actually spend just a little bit of time walking you through this figure because there really is a lot of information you can get out of it. So it's worth taking a little bit of time with it. What you'll see here is this sort of standalone x-axis. And my model output probability, you know, that percent of that percent chance of a debris flow, according to the model, is actually increasing from uh, from right to left, as opposed to the normal left to right. So we are the, essentially the model is becoming more and more confident of the debris flow as we move to the left. Now, simultaneously, you'll note that as this model output probability is changing, our trade-off between our false positive rate and our true positive rate is also changing. So one way you can think about this is that we want to set some decision boundary where we are maximizing our true positives and minimizing our false positives. So where would, you know, another way to put it is where would you draw this line? You know, at what probability would you say, okay, anything above this will be debris flow, anything below this will be a non-event? Um, you know, there is no one right answer to do this. Uh, if you are more conservative, or if you are a little bit more liberal and you want to capture as many debris flows as possible, knowing that you might have a few false alarms, you might try to draw a decision boundary right here where I have this box. So in this case, this would be around 80%, um, maybe a little bit less. And so you say, well, anything the model spits out that is above 80% will say, well, that's a debris flow. And as it turns out, within our data set, in fact, 100% of our debris flow events uh, were associated with model probabilities above 80%. Unfortunately, another 20% of rainfall events that did not produce a debris flow, well, this model is also saying uh, led to, or it also thought was a debris flow, which means that you now have a false positive rate of 20%. If you were a little bit more concerned about minimizing the number of false alarms, you could set your threshold basically right around 100% in this example. So in this case, what you'll see is that around a model output threshold of say 98, 99%, well, 50% of the uh, rainfall events that led to debris flow, in fact, were um, at this model threshold probability or higher. Um, and thankfully, zero events that uh, are essentially zero um, or all of the events that did not lead to debris flow. In fact, the model had an output probability below that threshold. Uh, so it really depends on what you're trying to capture here. If you want all of the debris flows and you're okay, or if, <laughs> if you want all the debris flows, if you would like to capture as many debris flow events as possible, you can set your threshold here and you might know that, hey, I'm gonna have a few false alarms, but it's really important for me to accurately forecast or accurately um, call every single event, um, especially if you were a manager and any in a single missed event was game over for your community, this is where you might set your threshold. On the other hand, if a single false alarm is just if you cannot afford any false alarms, this is where you might go. Um, and so ultimately, I hate to um, I hate to almost throw the question back at um, the audience here, but it really is um, there really is no one right way to do this. But you always want to find the best combination that suits your needs, as um, you know, in the context of how you would like to use this model. Now. I know I presented a lot of information for you, and you are also getting a lot of information today. So if there are just a few things that you take away from this, I really want it to be what I have listed here. Essentially, post-fire debris flows are a real and present hazard, and they're just going to become more common, unfortunately. Thankfully, we are working on a model that is able to start understanding the hazard associated with these activities, just using remote sensing, and we're able to do so using very few inputs compared to other models. Really, we need some sort of measure of slope from topography, a measure of the burn severity or the intensity of the fire, 
and some accurate characterization of the rainfall in an area. Now, all this goes into generating a model that is uh, producing a probability. And that probability is challenging to directly link to the, the physical occurrence of debris flow, uh, at least on its own, but by having a robust enough uh, training data set, we can find the most optimal threshold that can maximize the number of true positives and minimize the number of false alarms that we have. Um, you know, like I said, this model is a work in progress. You might see that I haven't shown a lot of uh, final results. That's because we're constantly working on them. But one of the cool things that we're really proud about is that once this model is in place, we can begin using it to assess the threat of these events almost anywhere on the planet. There will always be caveats, but it's something we're very proud about and something we're putting a lot of work into making sure it is as useful and not as, as useful as possible, but also without overreaching. Um, that will be it for me. I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm always happy you know, if you want to email me. I love talking about this stuff, um, but otherwise I will pass it back on. Thank you so much. Thanks, Eli. We will now transition to the question and answer portion of today's webinar. Please enter your questions in the Q&A box. We will answer them in the order that they were received. We will post the Q&A to the training website following the conclusion of the webinar. For those interested in a certificate of completion, there will be three homework assignments throughout the course of the six-part training. Answers must be submitted via Google Form, which can be accessed from the training page on the RSET website. The due date for all three homework assignments is June 8, 2021. This is two weeks after the close of the webinar series. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live webinars and complete the homework assignment by the deadline of June 8. You will receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course from Marinas Martin. Contact information for all of today's trainers is provided below. We've also provided links to the training page, the RSET website, and to social media. We encourage you to follow us on Twitter to stay informed about upcoming trainings and events. And now, let us proceed to the Q&A session. Wonderful, and thank you for everyone that has been submitting questions. We are getting quite a few of them, so please uh, we encourage you to uh, definitely enter any questions you have in the box. And again, we will uh, answer them in the order that they were received. So the first question, question number one, what should I do if my net package ends in between and I'm not able to attend further? Uh, I would assume that person is referring to maybe an internet package that they have and they might lose uh, access to the internet, uh, that is an assumption. So if, if that is incorrect, please re-enter your question. But if you do lose internet in between any of the sessions, you can always access the material uh, as well as the video from today's training, which we will post to the training page in the next two days. So you can re-watch this video from today's webinar, as well as access all of the materials, uh, basically the slides that you saw today, from the link that we've provided below. So no fear, uh, we do understand that internet connectivity is a very real thing and it's not always consistent. So uh, if you do, for whatever reason, lose access to internet, uh, you can always access all of the content from today's webinar. Uh, question two, what type of camera is an automated rain triggered camera? I ask because most remote cameras are triggered by movements. So they would capture movements made by wind, animals, et cetera. Uh, and to answer this, Eli, do you want to unmute yourself and answer? Sure, no problem. Thank you, Sean. Uh, so 
I posted this in the response form, but the USGS is primarily responsible for the installation of these cameras. Um, so I don't want to overreach, but I will say that in addition to um, the cameras, they're often setting up rain gauges, and I have pretty strong reason to believe that the two are linked together. So if the rain gauge is recording active rainfall, their camera should it indeed be on. Wonderful, great, thank you, Eli. And question number three, can we check runoff of another period where there's high precipitation and no fire events just to ensure that indeed the fire event led to increased runoff? And Eli, it looks like you might've answered this. Do you wanna unmute yourself? <laughs> sure, I'll, uh, I'll try not to answer all of them. Um, the, like, I, so yes, um, you should be able to see that. Um, in practice, this becomes a little challenging just because um, depending on where your gauge might be, it might not really be in a place where you can see that immediate signal from the, um, from the burn area. Um, I know this is rather vague. It really just depends on the placement. But in theory, you should always see some sort of reduced response provided the fire has um, produced a high enough burn severity. I wish I could give you a more concrete answer from that. Uh, but the truth is, uh, yeah, I'll just reiterate, yes, it's a little hard to see in practice, but it is there. And you should see it. Yeah, so I just want to add that even if there's no fire, sometimes heavy rainfall might result in increased runoff, and that just depends on the intensity of um, rainfall and how the terrain is and what season you are looking at, um, how much vegetation there is always. So a number of factors are there, but in general, the type of um, like increased runoff at the end of um, destruction of vegetation should um, be obvious, I think, depending on, as Eli said, where you have your stream gauge or, or where you're measuring it. Great, thank you both Eli and Amita. So question number four, some of the climate and hydrology data sets, oh, I'm sorry, um, is climate engine analysis available globally? Uh, there are several of the climate and hydrology data sets that are specific only to the United States. Those are products that were generated by agencies based in the United States. Um, so they are national, uh, but the majority of the climate hydrology, the majority are global, as well as all of the remote sensing data products that are available through that tool. So we definitely encourage you, if your study area is outside of the United States, uh, definitely we encourage you to explore the tool for your own study area. Question five, can you please provide information for a formal SPI calculation to a given period, for example, three months? Uh, so a three month, Standardized Precipitation Index, or SPI calculation, uh, is comparing the same three-month period to every other three-month period from your data set. Uh, it can be interpreted as the number of standard deviations by which the observed anomaly deviates from the long-term mean. And we've provided a link for whoever asked that question to be able to dig deeper and to learn more about that index specifically. So we encourage you to explore more through the link provided. Question six, besides and DBI, what other vegetation indexes are the most recommended for post-fire analysis on vegetation? Um, whoever answered this, do you want to unmute and speak up? Yeah, Sean, I, I answered this question. Uh, traditionally, you'll find that the normalized burn ratio, or NBR, is one of the most common evaluation metrics of burn severity. Um, I provided a link to the USGS and how they calculate it from Landsat data. Um, but if you are ever interested in doing this yourself, I highly recommend the MBR as well as the NDBI. Great, thanks Eli. Question number seven. When using Climate Engine, many regions on the globe do not return data such as precipitation using CHIRP's Pentad precipitation. How can we access data for these regions? Uh, this actually surprises me, uh, CHIRP's precipitation is global, uh, the products are global. Um, so this could be having to do with other issues that potentially you might be having. Uh, it could be um, uh, internet connectivity, uh, maybe it's just a slow internet is causing the tool to time out over time. 
uh, I have experiences personally, and, and we've had other people from previous webinars that did email me with the same issue. One of the ways to troubleshoot this, uh, if you're just if you're not generating any results after a couple minutes on your screen, uh, due to internet connectivity or something else, is in the top right corner of the window. There's a reset button, and I do encourage you if you're having a long lag time without any results, um, that could actually throw off subsequent analysis that you're trying to do within Climate Engine. So if, again, if you're waiting for what seems to be a very long time, uh, we do encourage you to click reset. That basically clears any of the analysis that are running in the cloud. And then that way, the when you go back in to run the analysis, uh, hopefully that will you know help to, to resolve that issue that you're having. Um, but again, the, the chirps pentad precipitation should be global, so you should be able to run it um, unless it's, you know, maybe uh, at the North Pole or the South Pole, um, those are probably the few places that you would not be able to, uh, to run that analysis. So question eight, are there any studies to compare the precipitation data between ground station data collection and its data, uh, data from Landsat? If any, which one is more reliable? Yeah, so... Um... Precipitation based on Landsat is not derived. You can look at clouds from Landsat, but not precipitation directly. Um, so it, it has mostly visible and near infrared bands, and it's used mostly for observing land cover. Uh, so precipitation is, is not available from Landsat, so you can't compare with in situ data. But there are other sensors which provide uh, precipitation and I think Eli has provided a link here. Um, right, Eli? Um, you, you, you want to oh, it's actually me. Um, yeah, I put it. I put a link in there. It's to uh, specifically to the GPM mission, but it refers to uh, a lot of the uh, satellite-derived uh, precipitation uh, missions. And there's also a long list of references. I believe there's 30 references at the end of this link uh, that you can explore more. And a lot of them have to do with validating. Uh, you know, rain gauges and ground truth data to uh, satellite derived uh, precipitation estimates. So we do encourage you to explore that if you're wanting to learn more about validation of satellite or aerial derived precipitation products. Question nine, could you explain a bit more about editing the code in Google Earth Engine and to set the time period and region? For example, creating a map based on uh, calculation of the mean for June, 2020, uh, in California. So it looks like the one of the uh, examples that was shown in the slide from Amita, uh, they wanted to know specifically on how to, to run that code and to interpret it. So uh, for those that are just generally wanting to learn more about Google Earth Engine, we've provided a link below where you can explore uh, basically how to answer the questions that were addressed in, in question number nine. Uh, and we also want to have a, a plug that our set will be running a training specifically on using Google Earth Engine, and this will be for application of land monitoring. So we do encourage you uh, to join us next month, actually, to, to join if you're wanting to get more uh, technical skill set using Google Earth Engine. Uh, this is not in the context necessarily of, uh, you know, say a California case study, but, uh, but there will be other case studies shown and with a lot of hands-on uh, things that you'll be able to learn. So for those that are wanting to get more dangerous with Google Earth Engine, uh, definitely um, join us next month for that RSET training. And it looks like somebody's also added uh, code. Anybody want to speak to the code that was added? Yeah, so this this code is an example which uses a specific region. You can see let, let alone there and also a date range. This particular segment finds median, but you can replace that with mean and find mean for the period. So it's just a simple code that you can look at to calculate mean. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Amita. Uh, question number 10. How do wildfires affect agricultural lands and crop productivity? Are some crops more at risk than others? So, um, for uh, crop burning is used by farmers, and there's a link here that provides um, um, summary of that, why farmers prefer to burn their crops. And also this National Geographic article also explains how fires can be useful for uh, restoring uh, land in uh, for nutrients. Also ecosystem health is improved. 
it improves grass cover by removing unwanted vegetation and you know improves ability of soil to hold water all these are all these benefits are there and you can read about those i'm not sure about which crops uh, are more at risk than um, others uh, but mostly the control fire is is used for stubble and straw burning that's where that burns fast because it's dry but particularly which crops are more at risk i am not sure and we can uh, look into that and let you know if we find the right answer great thank you and i'd also encourage whoever asked that question to go back to the second part of this webinar series where we did cover the anthropogenic caused fires. So these aren't wildfires, these are intentionally caused fires for, uh, as Amita was referring to, you know, uh, either clearing uh, agricultural residue pre or post harvest or planting. So uh, definitely go back and uh, we do have some uh, uh, slides of value to that uh, person in, in the second part of this webinar series. So question number 11, how uh, would you have the Google Earth Engine link for this model? So I assume that's in reference to the post-fire debris flow model uh, that I'm working on. And I know there's another question similar to that. This model, so we are um, continuously refining it. We want to make sure it is as accurate and reasonable as possible. Um, and unfortunately, that means that we have to go through a significant export control process as part of uh, NASA regulations, as well as uh, having published the paper describing it. So in the meantime, it's not publicly available. Um, but it will be later on this year. And th this covers both question 11 and question 13. Uh, but please stay tuned, because I am very excited to share. Great, thanks Eli. Question 12, have you been able to automate the scene selection process necessary for the Delta normalized burn ratio assessment, pre-scene and post-scene, or does this require an analyst to manually evaluate as currently practiced by MTBS? Yes, that is a phenomenal question. So um, whoever was asking that, I, I appreciate how you got right to the source there. Uh, the short answer is no. Um, we do not, does not require manual uh, scene validation. Uh, part of the way we've been able to do that is through actually creating, through automating the process of creating these cloud-free Landsat composites for a given area. Normally we look at the six months leading up to the fire. We take the median, we create a cloud-free composite through cloud masking. We then select the median pixel as the uh, pixel in, or the, the median pixel in that time series stack as the representative pixel for that location. Um, we do the same thing for the post-fire imagery. So we look at around the six months following post-fire, we create a cloud-free composite, and then we take the median pixel. This is supported by the literature. Um, I will, when I have a chance, I'll dig up the paper that describes this method. Uh, but you know, this is something that we made sure um, was supported through a peer-reviewed publication before doing it. And it indeed circumvents the normal process that MTBS uses, um, which for everyone else on, on this webinar, um, the MTBS stands for the Monitoring Trends and Burn Severity Group. And you can consider them as the preeminent post-fire response team in the United States. So they're very trustworthy. And I will also include a link to that website um, following this webinar. Great question. Great, thanks Eli. Uh, moving on, question 13. Uh, any example of the conceptual model in Google Earth Engine? Uh, code or published paper? Uh, yeah. Yeah, same as uh, same as question 11. It will be coming out. I regret that I can't share with it, share it with you all now. Um, we are publishing the paper and have to go through a little bit of the, um, the bureaucratic review process before we can get it out there, but please stay tuned. Great. Question 14. Many thanks for this fabulous presentation. Well, whoever asked that question, we appreciate that. Uh, we appreciate those kind words. I'd like to know the spatial and temporal resolution of the CHIRPS precipitation data. Uh, cheers. Uh, spatial resolution of CHIRPS precipitation is uh, 4,800 meters, uh, which is roughly 1 20th degree. And off the top of my head, uh, I don't know. Uh, for the Pentad, it's, it's a 
it's obviously these are uh, combined five day uh, time steps. I believe it is a daily temporal resolution, uh, but we will confirm and get this in there. But the Pentad is an aggregation of those daily into a five day time step. So, uh, but I do believe it is daily uh, product that's generated. But we will get back to you and we will put that. So when we post this on the website next week, we will have the, uh, the uh, answer. So question 15, how is the accuracy level for small areas? Yes, uh, that is an area of improvement that we would like to see in the model. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that we are using exclusively globally available data. Um, you know, the whole point is that you that these inputs are available everywhere. So the higher resolution inputs that might be location specific are incompatible with the model. Um, of course, one of those drawbacks is that smaller areas will suffer from uh, model accuracy will suffer in smaller areas. And the limiting factor here is really the precipitation uh, information that we're gathering. It's at approximately 11 kilometers spatial resolution. So every pixel represents 11 kilometers. Uh, so just given the limitation there, if you were to try to reproduce this for a smaller area, um, as much as I would like to say that this model is perfect in every way, it's not. I would encourage you to, you know, you're welcome to use 30 meter Landsat data, um, 10 meter Sentinel data, slope data, um, or even high resolution imagery if you can find it. Um, but I would highly encourage you to use rainfall that is a little bit more specific to your area. These could be local rain gauges, or it could even be uh, ground-based radar sources that might be available. Um, there, are a number, there are a number out there. If you have more specific questions, though, please email me and I can even try to point you towards some resources. Great. Uh, and question 16, again, over to Eli. Dr. Eli Orlan, could you please repeat slide 13, setting a decision boundary? You, you humble me, uh, anonymous audience member. I am I'm a Mr. Elijah Orlan, but I sincerely appreciate that. Um, I, for the sake of time, I uh, just, I want to be conscientious of what we have here. So I will, I've provided a overview uh, blog post that does a really good job describing this. Um, but I'll very quickly say that the whole point of that curve is to just uh, plot out the model's specific relationship and how the true positive rate and the false positive rate both vary as a function of the probability decision boundary that you might set. Um, this is unique for every single model. So it's something that you have to end up setting yourself and it has implications for the model's interpretability from there. Um, I wish I had time to speak about it more, but this, um, the link that I provided and also the recording of, the, of these slides will hopefully be able to give you a little bit more information. Great, question 17. In your slide, burned soils are chemically altered by high heat to form a hydrophobic layer. Is this damage less with low intensity fires like prescribed burnings? Yes, that's a phenomenal question. Um, I So I cannot speak to the prescribed burnings mostly because I focus on wildfire. Uh, and so I don't want to overreach and make a claim that I don't have confidence in. Um, that being said, you are absolutely right that the development of a hydrophobic layer does vary based on the burn severity. So you'd expect that after some general general threshold of burn severity, that's when you really start seeing the precipitate or the uh, vaporization of these organic volatiles that then re-precipitate down into the soil. Um, that is, a, you know, it's a chemical reaction. It's one that relies on input energy to the system. In this case, it's heat. So that is absolutely triggered by um, the intensity of the heat itself. This is also a very ongoing investigation. So a lot of people are looking at this and trying to do a better job really quantitatively describing this relationship. So I would encourage you just to keep an eye on the literature because we're still learning about it. Okay, great. Question 18, is there any impact of fire smoke on the quality of the data imagery like cloud cover? There is. Um, so this, yes, short answer is absolutely. And one of the ways that we go about uh, trying to work around this is creating those cloud-free composites from Landsat. Um, they're very easy to do in Google Earth Engine. Uh, so it's something we can automate. And the same paper that I referred to in another question, asked about Landsat pixel selection, um, I will put that in here too for this question too, because it does a good job describing um, some of the ways you can more confidently generate these uh, pixel, uh, excuse me, these 
burn severity metrics. Great, thanks, Eli. And we'd also recommend uh, whoever asked that question to, uh, to refer back to parts three and four of this webinar series where our air quality team uh, focused some on, on that very uh, question. So we do hope you will refer back to parts three and four of this, of this webinar series. Question 19, do we have a real world example of a post uh, fire debris flow forecast enabled preventive measures before the event occurred? That is a um, wonderful question. It is one that we are actually, the whole point of this work is to try to answer that question right now. Um, so I cannot give an example for this model in particular. Um, I mentioned at one point earlier that the USGS has a version of this model and it has inspired a lot of the work that we are doing. Uh, in the 2017 paper from Staley et al, which I'd be happy to link here as well, uh, they do a few case studies showing what this looks like and how it can help people in regional and re small regions of the United States. Um, it's not exactly a forecast, it's again a little bit more of a case study, um, but the whole point of what we're doing is to get exactly to what your question is asking, provide real world examples of these forecasts. And right now, it's just an active area of study. Great. And question 20. I would like to ask if there is any plan on approving the global burn area mapping models using better resolution. Yes. Um, that is also a uh, continuing area of study. It's not something that I am tasked with doing specifically. Um, normally, I'm the one who is able to sort of enjoy the fruits of everyone else's labor for burned area mapping, and then take advantage of those mapped burn areas to do my own analysis. Uh, but you will see in the future that, you know, that, again, this is an ongoing area of study. I feel like I'm saying that a lot, uh, but the truth is, um, no pun intended, this is a hot topic. So <laughs> a lot of people are looking at this, and uh, oftentimes the developments that are coming forward are rapid, and you'll find that um, every few months you'll see a new paper describing it. So again, I would just say stay tuned because you will see improvements. Eli, I love the pun. That's, that, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Got to keep things light. Um, question 21, how do you process and fix the scanline error in Landsat 7, which results in some missing data in the region of interest? So there's a link provided here. Uh, it talks about how to correct for scanline errors. Um, you may want to visit that and look at it. There's also, you will see a segment, if it fails, what you do. So um, we, we recommend that you do this link. Okay, question 22. As, as somebody not familiar with machine learning, how did you produce the receiver operating characteristic curve, or ROC, for your case study? It's an extremely valid question. I ask questions like that all the time when I see people's work. The, this is something that you can do manually, but thankfully the machine learning community has become so widespread. There are a number of software engineers who create different code packages to automate this entire process. Um, so despite that this could be done manually, I'm using a package in the Python programming language called scikit-learn. It's spelled S-C-I dash um, K, wait, I don't want to misspell it, but, but S-C-I-K-I-T hyphen learn. I paused because I forgot where the hyphen was. But scikit-learn has built-in functions that will allow you to generate all of these automatically. Like I said, you can do this uh, yourself manually, but it certainly helps save me some time. Question 23, how do you assess the accuracy of your prediction model? Yes, that is also a question where there is no single right answer. However, um, in the simplest sense, normally we try to pick a statistical metric that we want to maximize in some way. This could be, um, there's a measure that you commonly derive from ROC curves called the area under a curve. Um, for the point of this answer, I'll say that that value varies from zero to one. Uh, one means that you have a perfect model. So sometimes you are working to maximize an a, the AUC value. 
uh, the USGS uses something called the threat score, and that is a essentially a ratio between um, your false positives, your true, your true negatives, your false negatives, sorry, your false positives, true positives, and your false negatives, excuse me. Um, and they sometimes work to maximize those scores. There are always caveats. For instance, the highest AUC value might not be the most physically consistent model, in which case you would intentionally have a lower AUC value, but one that is more physically representative of this process. So that is a caveat where um, we are working to use these metrics to assess the accuracy, but if they're not physically consistent, we know that that's not something that we want to publish. So in short, there's no one right answer, but oftentimes using different statistical metrics really helps guide us to that right answer. Question 24, can one use synthetic aperture radar or SAR, uh, in this case they're using an example of Sentinel-1, to record debris flows? You, I, oh, sorry, go Eric, ahead. Sorry about that. Yeah, er, er, Erica, you, well, Erica is there, so maybe she can uh, help with that. But I think um, I, it can look at debris flow, right? It would be able to monitor it. I will say the sorry, Erica, if you're on the call, I do not want to speak over you. So go ahead. Go ahead, Eli, if you have any more details. Um, <laughs> sorry, I, I'm not trying to, I swear I'm not trying to answer every question here. Um the there's some folks that we work with out of JPL that are uh, monitoring this right now. The, it's You'll hear this again, it's a work in progress. Um, it's This method is showing some promise, but it needs to be improved. There you go. Okay, question 25. Uh, does the carbon dioxide released in all global fires greatly exceed anthropogenic CO2? So uh, globally, I'm not sure, but case studies have been done for California, also for British Columbia, and I will try and find um, some references for that. That in some cases, yes, the, the carbon dioxide put in the atmosphere is more than you would find from, say, fossil fuel burning for that period. Um, some, in some cases, it's twice as much in short period. But globally, it, it, I don't know what the answer is. This is regionally, it's been um, studied. So I'll find some references and, and here. Great, thank you, Amita. Question 26, is runoff coefficient for various permeable surfaces considered, like Manning's coefficient for estimating surface runoff, for different surfaces like vegetation, hard surfaces, pavement, et cetera? Uh, yes, so GLDAS model, it does take into account that, uh, what, what surface it is and accordingly what characteristics it has for, run, for runoff. So yes, answer is yes. And question 27. I assume that today you are mostly talking about large wildfire events. We are located on the continental watershed and the farmer's practice is to annually burn at the beginning of spring, just before the rainfall season. So we do have large areas that burn each year with some runaway fires as well. How would you measure the effects these fires have on downstream water quality and how would this be quantified? So uh, if this happens every year, uh, probably you should see if you if you again monitor water quality at different time of year, um, you should be able to see the difference. It, but quantifying, you uh, in this case, you do need some in situ measurements and then try and relate with uh, runoff. So that's the only way to quantify, but you should be able to see the impact of um, post-fire uh, runoff and water quality. So 
So if it is annually done, maybe the, uh, the sediments or ash or nutrients, they will, will show um, inter uh, like annual cycle in this you know, pre-fire and post-fire, I believe, but it has to be seen. For quantifying, then you actually have to have um, in situ measurements as well as watershed parameters and try and relate them um, somehow uh, statistically or empirically to get a uh, better idea. Great, thanks, Amita. Question 28. Can you recommend some reference to understand the decision boundary? Yes, uh, so uh, Brock put, put something in the chat and it will also be in the question and answer form, but yes. Great, thanks, Eli. Question 29. In fire risk modeling, you usually include variables with different spatial resolutions, example, uh, modus NV, NDVI and chirps precipitation. How do you combine these two resolutions? And what is the spatial resolution of the model? That's a, that's a great question. And uh, I'll try to keep the answer as concise as possible. It's a little bit, uh, it's a little tricky. Uh, we really try to assess debris flow hazards at the watershed scale which in this case is between 20 to 60 square kilometers in area. Um, the actual input data vary in scale, and we don't necessarily combine them at any point in time. So it's not like we're stacking an 11 kilometer pixel on top of a raster of 30 meter pixels. Really, we're doing a 30 meter analysis within this larger area, or we're doing analysis of 30 meters within this larger basin area. And we're doing a separate analysis at um, so 11 kilometers per pixel within this larger area. And then we're summarizing those, uh, the variables that come out of these analyses, such as the mean of all these pixels. And then those turn into uh, a tabular data set, which is then used as input from the machine learning model. Uh, so it, it's a little bit, it's not quite the most straightforward answer, but it really does vary. Great, Eli, thanks so much for that. Uh, question 30, post-fire debris flows are possibility based on heavy rainfall in subsequent years. How can post-fire damage be dynamically monitored for possible debris flow? Do we have any specific satellite application in this regard? That is an awesome question. Uh, the there are a few different ways we've been looking into this. I actually will link a paper that was just accepted for one of my colleagues at the USGS, and he is doing exactly what you asked. And he's using the leaf area index as a metric. Um, that being said, that metric is not a standalone way to assess this issue, but it simply aids in how they assess vegetation or landscape recovery over time. For more information, I'll provide a link so you can look it over. Great, and question 31, any chance to get your links towards Google Earth Engine Analytics? Yes, they will come once we can get uh, everything published and approved at the uh, NASA HQ. Good luck with that, Eli. Uh, question 32, what is the best way to isolate masking the burn scar from other objects in satellite data to create, for example, a shapefile in GIS software? Um, I'm not sure uh, what the question is. So if, what is the best way to isolate the burn scar from other objects in satellite data? So, so I think, um, we saw that, or we will see that next week, how to look at burn scar. Okay, question 33. Hello, Eli. I really enjoyed your presentation, especially the part about understanding model probability and how to set a decision boundary. Do you think that a brief flow model will work well for burns that occur in flat areas? Have you ever looked at it? 
Which variables did you discover to be the most important? Did you perform an uncertainty analysis on the input data before feeding it into the model? I was wondering if the hydro sheds were inaccurate or if the uh, normalized burn ratio or burn severity was less accurate on the steep slope due to the shadow. Well, hello to you. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a great series of questions. I will say that it's, a, I guess, a bit of a gift and a curse here that these sort of events are mostly contained to steep slopes. Um, so really anything, again, this is a very general value, but if a slope is above 14 degrees, um, that's when you might start asking if this could happen. There are clearly a number of other factors that influence this, but think of that as just a very broad threshold. So all that being said, uh, we have not looked at burn areas, uh, burn areas that are in on flat ground, particularly because the literature that we found and the folks who have really pioneered this work at the USGS have noted that they um, are less of an issue. Um, to your point about the hydro sheds, um, one of the challenges is that to create a data set of our own um, would be its own undertaking a paper and several years of work. So we are limited to what the world what WWF has provided with hydro sheds. I cannot necessarily speak to its accuracy um, as much as that it is one of the most respected data sets that's available of this type. Um, and the NBR, my understanding of how we're able to, um, or excuse me, the data that I'm using for the NBR is Landsat Collection 2 data. Um, and if not Collection 2, it, I think it's either Collection 1 level 1A data. Um, so that's actually gone through all of the pre-processing needed to correct for shadows. So I'm working with the raw or the processed surface reflectance data, which is considered scientific analysis worthy. So things like shadows are not, they're not meant to be of concern. Great, uh, thank you. Eli, question 34. Is there any software developed for the burn severity mapping? This is a simple software which I've developed using the Sentinel-2 dataset in Google Earth Engine. And here's a Git clone. Uh, it looks like they provided a link in case anybody's interested, but they were wanting to know if there's any software developed specific to burn severity mapping. I've seen a number of papers that work with this um, that sort of create their own algorithms through Google Earth Engine mostly because you can avoid all the data pre-processing yourself. Um, I'll refer to anyone else, you know, any of the other panelists that might know of some, but I personally see it mostly as Google Earth Engine scripts, like the one you provided. Great, question 35. Thanks a lot for highlighting machine learning. How confident are you on the application of deep learning for remote sensing, more particularly combined sources such as optical, uh, SAR, et cetera? Uh, so for the audience members, machine learning is a general form of uh, st you know, statistically informed modeling, you mostly taking advantage of the wonders of modern computers. Deep learning is a, is a subset of machine learning that takes advantage mostly of neural networks and their variants. Uh, so they're two set, they're related but separate fields. Deep learning in particular has extremely high promise for our field. There are a number of applications that use geospatial data in industry. Um, they don't necessarily solve the same problems that we're looking at, but they are well proven. At, there are a number of well well proven applications out there. For this sort of work, it is something that we hope to eventually uh, start looking a little bit more. Excuse me. To look a little bit more specifically at, mostly the limitations involve uh, the processing time. A number of the convolutional neural networks or CNNs that could be applied here and that work really well with assimilating different data sources are extremely computationally intensive. And on our end, we have not been able to explore it just due to timing. But I'll throw out a small, um, so I'll highlight someone in my group is actually using, uh, is working on creating an automatic landslide scar detection algorithm using convolutional neural networks. Um, once that is, if I can get a little bit more information on that, I'll provide it in the link. Or pro I'll provide it. Great. 
Great. Um, and question 36. The water quality gets degraded due to post-fire debris flow into the streams and beyond. How can we assess those changes? Uh, detecting changes in inherent optical properties or color dissolved organic matter or CDOM, color, chlorophyll concentration, or by other ways? So yes, all these will help. Um, so something like uh, chlorophyll say, may not change right away uh, after post-fire because once the runoff starts and nutrients get in, uh, then maybe chlorophyll will change. So if there may be some uh, lead lag relationship, but basically, yes, these parameters will help. You can also uh, look at suspended sediments or secchi depth to look at how turbid it is. So all these may help in uh, post-fire um, water quality assessment. Okay, we're getting close to the top of the hour. We have 15 minutes left, but if anybody has any questions, please uh, feel free to add them to the chat box and we will try to address them before we really run out of time. Hey, Sean, can I go ahead and answer number 32? Please, yes, Jonathan, yes. Okay, so going back to number 32, what is the best way to isolate the burn scar from other objects and satellite data to create, for example, a shapefile in GIS software? So if you have your raster data showing the burn scar, what you'll need to do is you'll need to find out what those burn scar pixel values are. And I think it's called the extract tool that you'll use. And you just want to extract those values from the raster and it'll just have the burn scar as a standalone raster. And then once you have that, then you can convert that to a polygon and convert that to a shapefile. Great, thanks so much, Jonathan. Special thank you to Eli Orland for his excellent presentation. Thank you so much for having me. Looks like another question just came in. Uh, question 37. I wonder if it is possible to optimize the ROC threshold by changing the slope data input from binary to multiple input. Yes, um, we are actually working with a continuous representation of slope data values. Um, there's a little bit of feature engineering that we do to summarize the, the burned area in a continuous fashion. Um, I apologize for the background noise here. Um, but you are absolutely right, and that is something that's a great example of different ways that you can just slightly tweak your input data to improve upon model performance. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay, looks like we've gotten a couple other questions coming in. Uh, question 38, is there a deep learning algorithm that uses pre-fire indicators like soil moisture, temperature, et cetera, to predict forest fires in the future? That is an awesome question. Um, I will not be able to give you an exact answer. This isn't something that I have looked at myself, but in all likelihood, the answer is yes. If I find anything, I'll post some links here. And it looks like question 39 is, is very similar. Thank you for mentioning machine learning in the presentation. Which machine learning algorithm is the best for predicting wildfire in your opinion? 
You know, I have played around with a few different algorithms and something that I think I've learned the hard way in my uh, career as a scientist is that it often depends less on the algorithm and more on your data sources. Um, of course, there are advantages to each algorithm. I personally, if I had to pick one, and it is also, um, this is completely subjective, you know, I find that with tabular data, tree-based models tend to perform uh, very well. And this is, again, just my opinion. I personally really like an algorithm called XGBoost. And one of the reasons why is that there are different constraints you can set for each input variable so that the results end up being physically consistent. So you can basically say, hey, as rainfall is increasing, the probability of debris flow occurrence also needs to increase. Oftentimes with messy data sets, you can find that the machine learning algorithm will essentially fit to noise and not actually produce anything that's physically meaningful. Options like what I just described are ways to circumvent that issue and make sure that each prediction is physically consistent. So for that, I'd say that these sorts of models, or that XGBoost is a great example, but it always goes without saying that if you don't have representative data for your problem, no algorithm will be able to solve that issue for you. Great, thanks Eli. And question 40, which I believe we will uh, end it on this question, which model would you recommend for wildfire susceptibility modeling of a vast grassland in an equatorial region? I'll say, I don't personally feel like I can confidently answer that question, so I'll refer to any other speakers. I don't want to overstep here. Yeah, I think we'll check on if uh, which exact model you can use for grassland susceptibility modeling for grassland. We'll get back to you on that. Well, a big thank to everybody that helped contribute to the question and answer session today uh, and everybody that asked a question. We greatly appreciate that. Uh, it's great to hear from the community what some of the questions that you have in terms of your research or, or you know, applied uh, science that you're doing in your own, own businesses. So you will be receiving at the end, at the conclusion of this six part webinar series, you will be receiving uh, uh, a survey and it's of immense value to us to be able to get that feedback from you based on how this training went as well as some of the research or or the science on, on on fire science that you're doing in your profession so we do hope that you'll take the time to fill out that survey which you'll receive uh, at the conclusion of this webinar series so uh, do look out for that in your inbox and know that we take all of that very seriously we we take all that uh, data to be able to improve these trainings uh, to tailor them to some of the questions that you have for, for your profession, as well as to improve just generally overall as our set goes forward. Uh, as we conclude today's webinar, we do want to promote the sixth part and the last part of the six part webinar series, which will be held on Thursday, which will cover satellites and sensors for vegetation based wildfire applications post fire. And some of the topics will be uh, the review of the fire life cycle. Uh, they'll be covered burned area and burn severity mapping as well as post-fire vegetation regrowth. And there will be a recap from the entire six-part webinar series. So we do hope that you'll join us in two days, this Thursday, for the sixth and final part of this uh, RSET training on fires. I also want to give a very big thanks to the RSET team that is on the call today. Uh, that is Brock Blevins, uh, Selwyn Hudson-Odoi, Jonathan O'Brien, Amita Mekta, Erica Podist, and we have a very, very big thanks to our guest presenter, Eli Orlan. Uh, thank you so much for joining, Eli. And uh, we'll follow up with you in terms of uh, the question and answer session, uh, make, making sure that we get all the links into that Q&A doc. For those that are interested in the Q&A doc, if you asked a question or you wanted uh, some of the answers that maybe somebody else asked, definitely go to the training page. We will be posting all of the Q&A uh, documents to our training page. Uh, hopefully by next week. So by next Tuesday at this time, we hope to have it cleaned up and filled out and then up live on the on our website so that you can uh, get access to that. But a big thank you to everybody that contributed today's uh, webinar and we look forward to seeing you in two days 
for the final part of this webinar series. So thank you everybody for joining and we hope you're all staying safe.